Hello everyone. Um, today I just want to talk a little bit about 35 millimeter cameras for anyone interested in uh, 35 millimeter photography and cameras, um, different types, maybe you're shopping for one or you have one and want to know what else exists out there. I have a handful of my personal collection here um, just to show the different types. So one of the things that will set, um, actually, let me go over kind of the anatomy of a film camera because they really are very simple. Anything else you get um, are bells and whistles. So you have a lens. Um, one thing that will make cameras different from others is whether the lens can be attached uh, or detached and changed out for different lenses. So that's one aspect uh, of the camera that will make it different from others is whether the lens is something that you can change. But you've got a lens and within the lens you have the ability to control how much light enters the lens by opening and closing the lens. So I'm going to open up this lens and show you what that looks like. So there's a nice big opening there right and then I'm gonna close it down and show you what that looks like so you get a much much smaller opening so the job of the lens is to do two things one is it's gonna open and close and use that opening to control how much light is entering the camera so that's the the aperture um, and in addition to controlling how much light enters the camera, it also controls how much of your image will be sharp. Um, so those are the two functions, uh, sorry, that's the first function of your lens. The second function of the lens is to focus. Um, so it will have some kind of mechanism that moves the lenses in there to change the focal distance, meaning you know, how far away is your subject and to be able to focus accordingly. So you'll have a lens and sometimes it'll be something that you can change like on this type of camera or if you have a camera like this one or this one the lens will be built into the camera. The other function of a camera is to have a shutter mechanism um, and let me take this off of here. The shutter mechanism also controls how much light enters, but using a curtain to do so. And the way it controls how much light is entering is the speed at which it moves that curtain, um, either sideways or up or down, allowing a little slit of light to come through to the film. So in this camera, this little uh, cloth mechanism here is the shutter curtain. Um, on this camera, the shutter is a system of blades right here. And they will either move sideways, allowing a slit of light between them, or move up and down. Um, and the speed at which that moves is controlling. So you've got two mechanisms, the opening in the lens and the shutter curtain moving to control how much or how little light enters your camera you're also going to focus the image with this. If you add to that a roll of film, you're done. That, those are the main parts of your film camera. Now, the mechanism by which you frame and focus is also going to be uh, something that sets cameras apart. So this is a detachable lens camera with the focusing mechanism here. This is what's called a point and, sh point and shoot camera. We pretty much call anything with a built-in lens point and shoot. Um, there are some outliers, of course. But this is a point and shoot camera with a manual focusing mechanism built right into the camera itself. This type of point and shoot camera has automatic focusing lens, autofocus lens. So I don't have a mechanism anywhere here to control the focus. I'm going to be trusting that the camera will focus where I want it to focus. In terms of framing and focusing, this is where point and shoot, SLR, and rangefinder um, are very different. With a point, 
with a point and shoot camera, whether you've got a lens you have to focus yourself or not, one um, key uh, one key feature of these cameras is that when you look through the viewfinder to frame your image, you're not looking through this lens. You're actually looking through this one here. It's got a secondary opening right there. So when you look through the viewfinder on the back, you're looking through here. This is the type of camera that was very popular in the 80s. This is what, if you're my age, um, childhood photos were taken on. And there's a couple problems with this system. If you're looking here but shooting here, there's a bit of a discrepancy. That discrepancy is called a parallax error. And the closer you are to your subject, the more kind of off your viewfinder is from what your camera is actually seeing. So these are the types of cameras that sometimes gave you pictures with people's heads cut off. Um, or sometimes you had backgrounds in focus rather than the subject because you can't tell where the camera is focusing in order to correct it. You're just trusting that the camera gets it right and it doesn't always do so. Um, so those are kind of the issues with this. Now, I don't want to say the more expensive the better, but something that will set higher end cameras apart is that they do a better job of adjusting the viewfinder at such an angle that minimizes that, uh, that parallax error, that discrepancy. So it reduces the chances of cutting somebody's head off. Um, this is another point and shoot where this is the lens that takes the picture, but this is the lens that you actually look through. They're, if they're not in the same place, you have to keep in mind that you're not exactly looking at the same thing your lens is looking at. There is that little bit of a discrepancy there. Early cameras were all like that. Um, and so the SLR, meaning, SLR stands for single lens reflex. The reflex part of that is this mirror inside of your camera. So the purpose of that is to act like a periscope, meaning that the light will enter through the lens, hit the mirror, hit the mirror on the inside, go up because the mirror is angled this way. The light will go up, hit another system of mirrors inside of this and come out the back. So when you put your eye up to this viewfinder, now you are looking exactly through this lens at ex and you're more able to frame the, the image more exactly. You're not looking through a second lens that's a little bit off to the side or a little bit higher. Um, so with these cameras, you can frame uh, which with much more precision what you're actually going to get. Um, so that's the difference between point and shoot and SLR. Now, the focusing mechanism is also different. Uh, with cameras like this, you have autofocus um, systems that, again, if you're not looking right through the lens, you don't really know uh, where you're focusing. With cameras like this, because you are focusing yourself, you can have a little more control over that. And you can do it two ways. You can use the distance scale on the lens. I'll show you a bigger one. See with this one, as I turn the lens, I'm pointing at different distances. That's, that's what that scale is on the lens itself. So I can either say, you know, my subject's five feet away. Let me move the focusing system to five feet. Now I've got a little bit more control over where the camera is focusing. That was also a problem that the SLR solved because if I'm looking right through the lens, I'm also seeing exactly what's sharp, what isn't sharp. As technology got a little better, then we've added, you know, split screens, um, matte screens. You know, when I look through this, I actually do have a, a split screen that matches up the image to let me know that it's sharp. But before these, we had what's called range finders. So this camera has it. This is not 35 millimeter, uh, but this guy has one as well. 
So this is also manual focus. Um, so what range finders are is you have a second lens. So this is the lens that's, that the light is entering and actually taking the picture. This is the lens I'm using to frame my image. Um, this is the one that's coupled to the viewfinder. But check out this third little lens over here. That is for what's called a range finder. So what a range finder does, um, and this was, you know, this was an invention that predated the SLR and kind of was the grandfather of the SLR, because it does use mirrors. But what it does is it acts like your two eyes. And, you know, the way our eyes work is you've got this angle of view, this angle of view, and by noticing where those two angles meet, we can figure out the distance um, where we want to focus. So basically, the camera has two eyes and can use those two mirrors to figure out how far away the subject is. And the way you see it is you'll actually see the two images and you'll see them line up. And once you've got the image lined up um, in the viewfinder, then you know that you've got that distance nice and sharp. Um, Contax uses rangefinders in their cameras. Leica is probably the most popular camera. Um, they might be the only company still making rangefinders, honestly. Um, but that's what they um, perfected and popularized was the rangefinder. So with Leica cameras, you're looking uh, through a viewfinder that's offset. You're not looking through the lens. Um, but you know, the reason they cost so much in addition to the, you know, the name and the workmanship um, is they really have perfected, one, the, the parallax error, that discrepancy between viewfinder and lens, but also they've perfected the rangefinder to make it very easy to focus with precision, even not looking through the lens that you're shooting through. So that's another thing that's going to set these cameras apart. Do I have manual focus or autofocus? Do I have an SLR? Do I have a rangefinder to make that manual focusing easy? The other thing that's going to make cameras a little bit different is going to be how do they handle where the film goes. So in the back of a camera, we'll do a little bit of anatomy again. The back of the camera where the film goes, you'll have one area where the film cartridge will go. And then you'll have an uptake spool here. Um, you'll either have to thread the film in, give it a couple cranks, um, or you'll have a more, um, a more electronically controlled camera like these that are more from like the 90s that will just, you know, I'll show you. With this one, all you have to do is put the end of the film right where that orange dot is at, at this edge of, of the camera. And as soon as you close the door, it just starts pulling the film. There's no threading. There's no having to line up any slots or anything like this. With this type of camera, there's little gaps here. I have to line up where the film's going to go. I have to line it up with the sprockets. And so it's a little bit harder to figure out if you've got the film loaded correctly. Now, on the back of the camera, you have what's called a, a pressure plate. This plate here, the job of this guy is to hold the film nice and flat against the back here. The, the flatter the film is against the back, um, the sharper your image is going to be. If your film is kind of at a wonky angle, the light's going to hit it at a weird angle too, and you'll get a soft image. You'll get, um, you won't have as much sharpness as you would like. Um, that, those are kind of like the more nitpicky little features that make some cameras better than others. Um, so for example, my little Olympus XA, that's got a pressure plate back there. Everything has it, but some are just better than others. See now this, this Canon point and shoot, the pressure plate doesn't stick out so much. It doesn't have as much springiness to it. So I can, just by looking at that, kind of decide this is not going to be as sharp an image 
as something that has a very aggressive pressure, pressure plate with that kind of um, difference in height because you want your film held very firmly. Um, so how the film gets loaded. Now, how the film gets loaded also goes hand in hand with how the film gets transported. If you've got a crank like this one on the camera, that means that after every time you take a picture, you're gonna have to manually move the frame along, meaning you'll have to manually pull the film from the cartridge onto that spool. So you take a picture, you, you move the film. Whoops, move the film. With a camera that has a, you know, it just has the orange dot, meaning it has an electronic motor in there. As soon as you take the picture, that sound is the film moving after every picture. Um, for these types of cameras, you were able to get motor drives that you would attach to the bottom. And basically what they were was that motor. Um, journalists would use them so they could keep shooting, shooting um, at a fast pace without having to move the film manually after every shot. So you've got cameras that automatically load and move the film for you. You've got cameras that you have to feed, you know, wind, and then you have to crank the film through after every shot. This one's also going to be an automatic feed. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing to feed it onto. So I'm guessing I just have to put the film into the edge here, close it, and it will automatically pick it up. This one has slots. So this one is something that you'll have to uh, manually feed. And then this one, instead of a crank, it actually has, um, let me see. It actually has a wheel that you use to move the film after every shot. So if, you're, if you've got a crank or a wheel, chances are you have to be very careful about how you load it and you have to move the film every time. Um, some will move the film for you. Um, what else makes cameras stand apart? Well, they all have lenses, but they're not of the same quality. So this is where people will have differing preferences and opinions. Um, there's some German companies, Leica, Zeiss, Schneider. They were known for, you know, just the best uh, engineering for their lenses, the best lens designs, which leads to the sharpest image possible. Um, Olympus, Pentax, Nikon, Canon, they all had uh, very good lenses, but they also had a range of lenses, just like they do now. They've got some really high-end, nice, expensive lenses. They also had some kind of budget, uh, kind of consumer-grade lenses. Um, so with those, that's where you can really get lost in blogs as to which is better, which is sharper. Um, there's also people who prefer kind of a softer lo-fi look to their images. Um, Olympus is known for great lenses, but the lens built into this XA is not the greatest. But this is also such a tiny pocket-sized camera that it's cool to shoot with anyway. So you don't want to always get carried away. Um, the other thing that you want to consider is if you're going to be using cameras from, let's say, 60s through early 80s, they're all going to be manual focus lenses. You can get SLRs just a little bit newer. So as an example, this, this camera is, I believe, from the 80s. Um, but just a few years later in the 90s, you can get a, an electronically controlled camera that uses the same uh, lens mount that Canon uses to this day. So this is one of my favorite cameras. But my all-time favorite, the one that gets used the most, is my Elan 3. The reason is it uses the exact same lenses as my Canon DSLRs, like the one I'm shooting this video on. So when I shoot any job that I want to shoot half, um, half analog, half digital, like when I shoot weddings, I always incorporate a lot of film for my clients. 
I can use this lens and a 5D or a 6D interchanging my lenses back and forth knowing that I don't have to have two sets of lenses. It also means that this camera, because it's from the 90s, has autofocus as well. So I don't have to, you know, fiddle with this, try to line up the rangefinder, um, or try to make sure it's sharp, you know, when there's a bride walking down the aisle. Um, it's a lot nicer to have something that autofocuses. So how do I load the film? How does the film transport? How do I focus? How do I frame? Am I looking right through the lens or am I looking through another lens where I have to now take into account that I'm not exactly looking at the image? Um, these are all considerations. How good is the lens on this camera? Um, does it have zoom? So for instance, this guy actually has a little bit of a zoom reach. So this is something I picked up at a garage sale. I just plan on making sure it works and um, having some fun with it. But this has a zoom lens. So for travel, this must have been just an ideal camera. Um, but this guy right here has no zoom. It's just a 35 millimeter lens. So I have to be fairly close to the subject or just make sure that I'm shooting um, maybe landscapes, wider scenes. Once I have cameras where I can change the lens, then it's up to me. I can, I can change the lens to whatever I want, put a portrait lens on here, put a landscape lens on here. Um, I can put a zoom lens on here. Um, if I go to an electronic, like the Canon, Nikon has the equivalent. I think the Nikon equivalent to this is probably like an F100. Same thing, it can use all the modern Nikon lenses if you wanna have a film and digital system that just works together with one set of lenses. That's, this is the way to go. Plus you have autofocus. What other features do these newer 90s cameras have that the older 70s didn't have? in addition to autofocus. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the cameras that look like this also don't have auto exposure. So this one does. Um, this is an OM4T. The OM1, um, the first of this generation, that was a completely manual camera. So in addition to manually focusing, manually cranking the film through, you also had to set the aperture and shutter speed for every photograph. Um, it's fun to do that. Um, if you've watched, if you know me at all, you know that my favorite camera to shoot with is a Hasselblad where everything is manual. Um, I'm okay with that in certain situations. It, again, if I'm shooting a job that just calls for concentrating on the subject, concentrating on the moment, concentrating on speed, I, I don't want to have to do that with every shot. And so a camera that I can put in aperture priority and let the camera change the shutter speed for me. Or if I, you know, maybe I'm letting somebody borrow the camera and I want them to have something that has a completely automatic setting. You can, you can do that with these newer cameras. Um, plus, you know, uh, being able to change where in the scene you focus. Um, older cameras only focus dead center. Um, cameras like this only focus dead center. So the pictures of a very sharp Eiffel Tower with very blurry mom and dad in front of it, those were very common with these types of cameras because they'll only focus right down the middle. With something like this, if I'm shooting portraits, I can make sure that I'm focusing right on my subject's eye. If I'm shooting a landscape, depending on, you know, foreground, background, where I want to put my focus point, I can do that. Um, this one, let's see, it says eye control right there. This is a really cool feature Canon had on a handful of cameras in the 90, where, in the 90s, um, where it could actually read where you were looking and focus there. So if I was, you know, looking this direction and I looked that way or I looked that way up or down, it would actually select the corresponding fo um, focusing point. Um, they discontinued that feature. There's a lot of uh, speculation as to why, um, but I happen to love uh, playing with that feature and it comes in really handy for work too. If you get an older, this is something that I need to restore so I don't have batteries in it right now. 
but if you've heard of the digital Rebels, well here's a 35 millimeter Rebel. So Canon has used the Rebel name for their entry level cameras for decades now. Um, and this is going to be again a camera with a fully automatic system alongside manual. Um, but it's, you know, automatic transport for the film, still compatible with all the lenses that are currently available. Um, these are also great cameras to get and they're going to be very easy to use. Um, something like a Rebel won't have the eye detection though. So, let's see, we've got range finders, meaning that you've got two lenses and a system of mirrors that give you an overlapping image to focus. You've got SLRs where you're looking right through the viewfinder. Um, unless you have really bad eyesight, you should have perfect focus every time. And then you've got point and shoot cameras that just autofocus dead center. You don't get to control that. Um, you've got cameras where you frame through the lens. You've got cameras where you're framing a little offset. So you've got to be careful of that um, discrepancy called parallax error. Um, and then you've got completely manual loading, cranking, uh, exposure setting. And you've got cameras that can do everything for you, including read your eyes. Um, so there's a variety of cameras that you can get. Um, this is just a few of the ones that I use the most um, of my favorites. The OM4T and the EOS 3 are my favorite film cameras to use, uh, 35 millimeter cameras. Um, I also like my little XA for just having something that lives in my bag just because it is so tiny. Um, but I hope I've given you some food for thought on 35 millimeter cameras and please hit me up if you have any questions. Um, I've been selling cameras since before this guy was on the shelf. So uh, it's just a little bit of what I've learned through the years that I wanted to share with y'all. Thank you.